this presentation is not an attempt to prove something. It is intended to get people thinking about a series of ideas being explored by scientists and philosophers of science that may eventually contribute to a better understanding of what cancer is and new roads to manage it. Oops. So there's your, my title again, System Biology Meets Bowen Family Systems Theory, Implications and Likely Outcomes. So I just thought I'd start first with uh, why Marta Bertolasso, Dr. Marta Bertolasso from Italy would be the person we've identified to be part of this year's conference. So I, here's a quote, um, family therapists are distinct as a group largely because of a common assumption. If the individual is to change, the context in which he lives must change. The unit of treatment, even if only a single person is interviewed, it is the set of relationships in which the person is embedded. Now that was published by some well-known family therapists from the 50s, Jay Haley and Lynn Hoffman. It's something that Murray Bowen wrote about a family. The family is a number of different kinds of systems. It can be accurately designated as a social system, a cultural system, a games system, a communication system, a biological system, or any of several other designations. For the purposes of this theoretical therapeutic system, I think of the family as a combination of emotional and relationship systems. The term emotional refers to the force that motivates the system and relationships to the ways it is expressed. So under relationship would be subsumed communication, interaction, and other relationship modalities. So Professor Bertolasso will be on later today uh, from Italy. Very pleased to have her. This was her book that I stumbled on, uh, just looking at Amazon's books and for things related to cancer and up popped this book, A Philosophy of Cancer. And I never thought of it that way before having what that would mean and subtitle a dynamic and relational view. Going back to one of the more famous of all uh, British developmental biologist Conrad Waddington. Uh, this is a quote from his writing. It is the understanding of the nature of the networks of interaction, which are involved in the process in which a collection of cells becomes organized into an organ with a unitary character. That still remains the central question when addressing living beings. So here is my interpretation of some of Dr. Bertolasso's ideas. And we've been in communication now for a year or so. Systems thinking, this is her thinking the way I gleaned it and interpreted it. Systems thinking leads to thinking of living organisms, not only as organized molecular systems, but also organizes, organizers of molecular systems. The origin of cancer seems to be entangled with the very nature of living things. Differentiation versus state holding processes that are counterbalancing processes. 
uh, Bowen theory would call these forces. So, but an imbalance of the above two processes may be at the root of cancer. And that certainly was an idea that grabbed my two uh, ideas about cancer. So proliferation versus differentiation. Uh, let me see if I can get this out of the way a little bit. Here we go. Cancer as a disease of cell differentiation rather than multiplication. A case of blocked ontogeny. That meaning the organism did not develop fully in some fashion. Bowen theory would call this an emotional attachment, unresolved emotional attachment parallel to that idea, blocked ontogeny, which is could apply to the schizophrenic person later in life and or others, severe sociopaths, etc., that their full develop, development was blocked in the process of ontogeny. So systems thinking leads to thinking of li li living organisms, not only as organized molecular systems, but also organizers of molecular systems. Getting at Waddington's question, the origin of cancer seems to be entangled with the very nature of living things. Differentiation, versus state holding processes, which are viewed as counterbalancing. And again, the imbalance of the two processes that Dr. Bertoloso emphasizes may be at the root of cancer. Differentiation uh, and differentiation. Cancer is a disease of cell differentiation rather than a blocked ontogeny, a case, a, a, it is a case of blocked ontogeny. So ca cancer results from the destruction of tissue architecture. In other words, the context, always the context has to be seen. Whereas me mechanistic models considered functions as incorporated in the parts intrinsically, systems approaches and systems biology look at the system as a whole and focus on the functions that emerge. Again, very familiar idea to Bowen theory people and the family. Among the cultural reasons for the emergence of systems views and theories, is the progressive erosion of traditional reductionistic paradigms that are unable to grasp the dynamic reg the regulative properties of complex systems. For example, the, the answer to cancer does not lie within the cancer cell and what's wrong with it. It participates, but it's a larger picture that has to be looked at. The common focus of system, systemic models is on the causal relevance of causal interactions among molecular parts rather than some causal molecular part, just as a cancer cell itself is not uh, causal on its own merits. It has to be in a certain kind of context and receiving various signals from outside that make the difference. A very favorite one here is genes are like the keys on a piano. Although they are essential, it is the context that makes the music. And when we're observing families, the relationship interactions are the ones that are making the music. The tissue architecture is critical to cellular homeostasis, 
and tissue specific functions. As metazoan cells, which are just cells that uh, have come together to form a larger organism than a single cell, in culture become free from the bonds of homeostatic influence necessary to coordinate the needs of a multicellular organism, the liberated metazoan cells may require latent ancestral properties, including proliferation, proliferation and mobility. So that's when there's been a breakdown of the interaction of cells in the body, somewhere in the body. So we must abandon the primacy of any heart whole framework and claim a theory of fields in the biological sciences. Again, I'm still talking about Dr. Martelosa's, Martelosa's ideas. And there she is herself <laughs> and dynamic relational view of cancer, which I highlighted earlier. Three big points here. Systems biology constitutes a unique synthesis between reductionistic, that's all in the molecules, and holistic, it's all in the whole approaches. Shame shift Murray Bowen made at NIMH, but much to be developed. The synthesis should be integrated instead of a, a positive or dialectical perspective. I don't know that I fully understood her thinking on that. I hope to learn more about that as she speaks at the conference. So treatment implications are very important here. How to balance relationships, thereby creating the viability conditions for physiology, viability conditions, as opposed to avoiding or fighting pathology. In other words, the effort to attack the cancer cells themselves as the problem, because there's something awry within them, is not enough. So again, why Bowen theory? So two ideas set the stage. This is borrowed from uh, David Smithers, a, I think he was a radiation oncologist. And this is an article he wrote uh, in The Lancet back in 1962. It's just in sync with the ideas that I'm trying to develop here. What we need most at present is to develop an autonomous science of organismal organization. What's, how, how is this? to be studied, the social science of the human body, a science not so naive as to suppose its units when isolated will behave exactly as they do in the context of which they form a part. And willing to recognize that whole functioning organisms are its proper concern. Again, that same theme. It will try to explain normal growth, differentiation, maintenance, and repair, as well as their disorders. It will take biological orderliness in action as its field of study. It lies in wait for a name between cytology and sociology. It is much more than oncology for it is the study of the organization of whole organisms, as well as the disorganizational tumor formation. It's bio, bio, -cybernetics, bio cybernetics, the science of organismal organization, the study of the foundation of life. So another quote from, <clears throat> Smithers, there is no such thing as a cancer cell, only cells behaving in a manner 
arbitrarily defined as being cancerous. Very important idea, I believe. And I've done this to that statement. There is no such thing as a schizophrenic. Only people behaving in a manner arbitrarily defined as being schizophrenic. I <clears throat> mean, meaning the problem doesn't reside solely within the schizophrenic per person. The cause of the problem does not lie within the individual or organism. So we're talking about the cellular level and at the family level. And I just uh, like Lauren Isley for his ideas. Uh, this appeared in 1946. Men talk of matter and energy of the struggle for existence that molds the shape of life. These things exist, it is true, but more delicate, elusive, quicker than fins in water is that mysterious principle known as organization, which leaves all other mysteries concerned with life stale and insignificant by comparison. For without organization, life does not persist is obvious. Yet this, yet this organization itself is not strictly the product of life or of selection. This is the part I kind of like. Like some dark and passing shadow within matter, it cups out the eyes of small windows or spaces and notes of a meadow's lark song in the interior of, the, of a model egg. That principle I'm beginning to suspect was there uh, before the living deep, before the living, anything called a life organism in the deeps of water. And that's one to think about. And I think it's one that suggests that physics may have something to contribute physical universe to understanding better what we're dealing with in the emotional universe. So first, a, or now historical perspective on all this. Uh, this is Claude Bernard, as you can see, 19th century figure, a physiologist who first didn't call it homeostasis, I don't believe. He called it du milieu interieur and identified it as a very important thing to study. Meanwhile, Louis Pasteur, uh, a painting there that was in the Bettman archive, the strength of, a back, of the bacterial invasion is the prime determinant of systems developing. In other words, trying to locate it in just one kind of set of variables and not appreciating the whole. And uh, Bernard countered with, they were, of course, uh, they were in the same period of time doing their work. Microbe leads to disease only if the body terrain is sufficiently disturbed. And that came to be known later as homeostasis. The milieu interior has to be disturbed. Otherwise, the body can deal with it. So Pasteur comes back with this comment, which I don't speak French, that Bernard was right. The microbe is nothing. The soil, meaning context, is everything. So this is a thing I developed some years ago called what I called a systems model of disease. Uh, may be accurate, maybe not accurate way to say it, but although physical, psychiatric, and behavioral disorders are considered manifestations of family emotional forces, such forces are not held to be the cause of an illness. The family doesn't cause it.
an understanding of any illness must include pertinent facts derived from all levels of investigation, intracellular to societal. The interplay among all the factors, interplay among all the factors must be examined with no single factor or set of factors viewed as causal. A model that can incorporate all the facts and their interrelationship without ascribing cause to any one fact is a systems model of disease, according to what I wrote back in 1992, managed to get it published surprisingly. So this is the, the idea I wanna put a lot of focus on here today is in spite of these opening comments is the idea that cancer as an emotional regression and that term regression is in biology, but not used in the way Bowen theory uses it. So the Bowen theory concept looks more like this. If chronic anxiety escalates in a relationship system, the system becomes less dominated by less thoughtful and more reactive ways of interacting that are older in an evolutionary sense than the advanced complex behaviors of a well-functioning relationship system. If you think of it in family terms, the family can shift from fairly mature interactions and slip down into very reactive reactions instead of what they're capable of in better conditions. So just to review for Bowen, people who are not Bowen theorists, that the theory uh, defines a continuum of basic levels of what are called differentiation for our species. Bowen impression from clinical study is that uh, it would be a bell-shaped curve with the majority of folks below 50 on the bell-shaped curve, and that this would be uh, and very, this would be theoretical that nobody is that mature, substituting mature for differentiated up at this end of the spectrum, at least yet. It's maybe it's something man could eventually evolve to. So with increasing experience with a wide range of people, there is evidence that most of the population is below 50 on the differentiation of self scale, as he called it. I often call it the differentiation of self continuum because we don't actually have a scale, scale you way on, get on in the morning, find out what your functional level is. Uh, so this is a continuum of human adaptiveness. So also um, the idea that this development of differentiation is rooted in a multi-generational process shown up here at the top. So let's say that these two people, their color maybe is 40 on the continuum of differentiation. They have two children, an older daughter, and a younger son, I've made the older daughter a little bit darker than the parents and the son um, a little bit lighter than the parents, which is, can be a product of family process, which I won't dwell on here at the moment. And that, then the other thing in the theory is that people of the same basic uh, adaptiveness or on the scale of differentiation choose partners oh, sorry about that it's a little 
complex thing going out on between here and the machine. So it's a very important issue, I think, to understand is that chronic anxiety is, uh, can be thought of as a multi-generational process too, even though there's a wide range of how it gets expressed. But in one first generation, it may be this average amount of chronic anxiety, the depth of the red. They can have a daughter who's overall gonna be less chronically anxious and a son overall a little bit more. And then you can follow through that because of the nature of adaptiveness, you come down to a continuum of average levels of chronic anxiety in a, everybody's multi-generational family system. It's not as if we have a choice about it, which is a very important perspective, I think, to gain. gets in the way. Okay. So Murray Bowen said this, all things being equal, a life course is determined by the amount of unresolved attachment to the family, a block in ontogeny, as we talked about earlier, family of origin, the amount of anxiety due to reduced adaptiveness comes from it and the way that anxiety is dealt with. That was his summary. Sometimes there it goes. One of my favorite video interviews I ever did with Murray Bowen was uh, back in the, I think this was in the early to mid eighties. And he defined what he called an open relationship. He had talked about it before, but this got more specific. That one can communicate in an open relationship. One can communicate his or her innermost thoughts and feelings to the other without fear of hurting the other and the other can do the same. If a person has this with at least one other person, it is ideal. It promotes health. Esther Sternberg, long career at the NIMH or the NIH, said this, the effects of these personal connections can be more soothing than an hour of meditation they can also be as stressful and more long lived as running at top speed for 20 minutes on a treadmill. That's what Esther had to say. She came to a number of our conferences in Washington and uh, so more and more emphasis on here is the, I think that what Bowen theory expresses better than anything else that's come along is what sustains chronic anxiety. Of course, because with, with something sustaining chronic anxiety, it's going to activate the stress response and that's going to affect a lot of things somewhere in the body. And again, I like this relationships function as if they are governed by two equally intense counterbalancing life forces. Individuality is best defined as a built-in life growth force toward individuality. So that he called them forces and the differentiation uh, of a separate self, which largely is governed within the family unit. And togetherness is derived from the universal need for love, approval, emotional closeness, and agreement. So both these of these are equally important. It's the balance, and I think that's something of what uh, 
Dr. Bartolosa was getting at too. Let's see if I can get this next one down here. Okay. Um, I can't read that myself. I forget which one this is. Uh, so let me just move on. I'll, I'll recognize the title of that when I get to it. So multi generational emotional process generates variation in levels of emotional functioning that significantly affect the level of chronic anxiety and life adjustment. Again, very important to think of it as a multi-generational process because it, I think it's a more neutral way of understanding and trying to uh, inspire without going looking for who's responsible for all this, who has caused it. Of course, it isn't reside in any one person. So a high level of chronic anxiety disturbs family homeostasis and triggers emotional regression if coping mechanisms get overloaded. Now I'll return to some of these points. The anxiety is disproportionately absorbed by one family member. The vulnerable member is governed by the family's patterns of coping with anxiety. So the system as a whole can sort of project its immaturity into one of its members and other members of the family uh, benefit from that. Chronic anxiety can disturb that person's homeostasis, which manifests as a disturbance in organ and tissue functioning somewhere in the body. So again, obviously, uh, put a lot of emphasis on the, what chronic anxiety can do in uh, activating a chronic stress response, which can activate all kinds of other things. This thing's hard to hit. There it is underneath. I don't know quite how, I guess I gotta get this out of the way. No, I can't do it. That's better. It's visible again. Okay. So just to summarize this idea of relationship balance, picture of course in Murray Bowen at his blackboard. So this would represent the father, the mother, two children. Uh, and with arrows, they're interacting with all of each of, each one is interacting with the others and affected by those interactions. This blue arrow that's dashed denotes that the uh, family system is in a reasonably level functional level doing fairly well with one another. Then a stressor can hit or a set of stressors from the outside of the family or come with inside the family. And um, so that relationship system in balance is being affected and that anxiety-driven disturbance in the imbalance of a relationship system beginning to decline in the functional level of the, of the family. Functional level, in other words, things are going on on a less mature level between the individuals involved. So now I show that there are the connections between them as wavy and red indicating there's, there's more anxious responding to one another, reactivity to one another. So 
So chronic anxiety escalates based on how the components of a system, people in this case, are interacting with each other, not as a consequence of the original stressors. And that's so very important. Outside stressor can be greatly amplified by what goes on in the family system to, uh, to become more reactive and function at less of a, a level than earlier. So I, I like to uh, put a lot of approach on what I call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Approval, attention, expectations, and distress. And, and the above here, I'm talking about the ability to self-regulate cognitively so that you can uh, regulate how you respond to the absence of approval or disapproval, of course, attention. Uh, you're getting expectations met and unmet and distress overall. And I would add a lot of uncertainty compounds all that. So now you've got a pretty anxious system there. And then, so these approval, attention and expectations and distress are being, people are coming, becoming more reactive to one or more of those. And, be, and that reactive process in the family generates more of the regression. So a disturbance in the balance of a relationship system generates chronic anxiety and chronic anxiety disturbs the relationship system balance. So this, here's a system is in now an emotional regression, meaning there's a, a significant decline in the maturity of its functioning, its functional level. So you can see there, everything's in red, interactions in red, red in each individual. I'm showing it that way. And so uh, at the top, you, I'm putting this in there, well differentiated families and a high level of self-regulation. In other words, when the attention is not forthcoming, there's less reactivity to it. The person has better emotional boundaries to be all hooked up and winning approval, et cetera. And so well-differentiated uh, system, it tends not to generate as much chronic anxiety due to high levels of self-regulation and low reactivity to these, what I call the four horsemen. Whereas in the bottom, the low level of self-regulation for poorly differentiated people, meaning a high reactivity to attention, approval, expectations, to distress and unsureness, uncertainty. And that leads to an escalation of chronic anxiety in the relationship and that fuels more reactivity. And I show them with less solid boundaries than the uh, one at the top. <coughs> See if I can get at this thing again. <coughs> so this is the outcome of a multi-generational process uh, that creates this divergence in families over generations, making it useless to blame the, your own parents. There's a bigger picture to be understood. 
and added factors again for how vulnerable a family is are stressors from the outside and if they're isolated, emotional cutoff. So they all figure in too. <clears throat> so what does it mean exactly? A disturbance in the balance of a relationship system. What is the balance that is disturbed? And really, Owen summarized this in a very simple idea. The fundamental source of anxiety that can drive emotional regressions and ultimately fuel symptom development appears to be threats to the balance between sufficient emotional contact and sufficient emotional distance. When those are balanced, uh, that things work better. When they get unbalanced, that's when things go awry. So what makes striking a balance more difficult? It appears that the intensification of the fusion or togetherness process, which it reflects a decline in the functional level of differentiation, is what makes it more difficult for people to balance contact and distance successfully when they're more anxious. For example, as anxiety increases, one person may experience an increased sense of responsibility for the other's distress, and at the same time experience a compelling urge to avoid the other person. And that changes the dynamic that could make it more favorable for one than the other. So increasing togetherness pressure occurs in response to increasing anxiety and reflects an attempt to restore systems balance, but it just gets out of hand. It's pushing the throttle instead of the brake. So if a comfortable balance is not restored, patterns of emotional functioning get activated to stabilize the now somewhat strained system. So a key understanding to symptom development in a family are the system generated buildup of chronic anxiety and the patterns of emotional functioning that are activated to cope with that buildup. Now I'll quickly go through these, the patterns of emotional functioning in human families that Bowen originally identified that are similar to relationship patterns in many other species include emotional distance, people just fighting it out and having contact and distance at the same time through the fighting. Uh, one can just give in to the other and go along. That's the dominant adaptive or deferential pattern. Uh, on the left there is the, the uh, male being in the deferential. On the right is the female. And it seems to shake out about equal over the course of looking at this society as a whole. And the triangle where two people band together to blame their source of anxiety on a third. And I like to say triangles are ubiquitous. I got that from a telephone ad years ago. Telephone booths are ubiquitous, I think it said. Anyway, so as true in other species, up to a certain level of activity, these patterns can help stabilize a system. When chronic anxiety escalates, the intensity of the patterns can then contribute to symptom development, manifesting in the mind, body, or behavior. So that's when the, it can be stable, but then it can get so intense that somebody pays a price for that in the family system. So there's a way to look at it that's, I put this into this type of diagram, that the difference between thinking pathology driven versus system anxiety driven, meaning this represents the individual's development, which includes genes, developmental experiences, and has effects biologically and psychologically and with the relationship system 
contributing to that. So then the treatment is blamed on a pathology in the individual. So then the treatment becomes trying to uh, treat that pathology when it, it's driven by anxiety. I hope I got sent that clearly enough because the other way of looking at it is that yes, family process of course is very important. Genes are important, developmental experiences are important, et cetera, biologically and psychologically, renders this individual vulnerable to some kind of dysfunction. So the individual mates up with another person and that winds up generating a level of anxiety in the system. And the anxiety is a property of the triangle again. And now let's say the father in this case, the is the one absorbing chronic anxiety the most in the family system and has can have then signs and symptoms related to that vulnerability. But here you're going to treat the system uh, plus the symptoms, which are often medications, et cetera, or surgery are needed, but you're also cognizant of the, treating the system and changing the context in which the individuals are living. Uh, Jak Panksepp, who is now deceased a few years ago, um, he talks about what he calls the affective comfort zone. And that's the emotional state of comfort. And on the right, the extreme emotional disequilibrium that can occur in individuals in family systems. And as he points out below here, alters the hypopituitary adrenal axis, as well as the autonomic nervous system as well as the psychosomatic information networks that, uh, that were the neuropeptides, all are affected. <clears throat> so mental, physical, and behavioral symptoms in Bowen theory are thought of as emotional disorders. So a disorder of the family emotional system that can over time range from one and to the other. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit now the biology of, of cancer. So I stumbled on this article when I first started being interested in uh, cancer. Um, when I first met with the families, I didn't think too much about tracking multi-generational emotional process. I don't know why I missed it, uh, but then I ran across this reference to an article, Aldred Scott Warthen, Heredity with ref reference to carcinoma, which was published back in 1913. And as you can see, I just show three generation things here. Uh, somebody had a cancer of the tongue at age 62, the larynx uh, in their daughter at age 63, and then breast cancer coming early, age 46. In other words, this there's a decided tendency for the neoplasms, 38 and 29, to develop uh, at an earlier age in the members of the youngest generations. It also is often more malignant. So that really snapped, got my attention that you can't overlook what's going on emotional process over the generations. So the hypothesis is, is this a multi-generational emotional process we're seeing 
this earlier onset. And it wasn't just for something get spot in cancer, it could spot it in diabetes and a host of other symptoms, even psychopathy. psychopathy. So these are, I'll just put these in, the hallmarks of cancer. The next generation, Hanrahan and Weinberg wrote about this in the cell uh, back in March, 2011. And I like this phrase, life is just self-renewal and differentiation. How do you reduce life to something so basic? stem cell biologist at the University of Southern California. So here you have the stem cell. It can self-renew itself, or it can differentiate itself into a more functional cell for fitting into the kidney or the liver or wherever it's going to be. And we're dependent on these stem cell divisions. And then this feedback on the stem cell about what's going on in the body and can affect the speed of that process. So tumors then are really systems of many cell types. I won't dwell on this, it looks a little complicated, but there's the cancer stem cells that generate the cancer cells. <clears throat> you got immune and inflammatory cells flooding the tumor. And, uh, and so there's, that all these other cells are also being part of this process. And Candace Perr, who again died way too young, asked this question in Molecules of Emotion, a book, <coughs> a book of hers. Was the cancerous tumor really part of a network receiving and sending information that linked it to the brain and the immune system. The link would provide a mechanism by which these body systems may regulate, control, promote, or retard the actions of one another. Again, an expanded view of what you need to take in. And again, here is uh, Minna Bissell. I think her name is on here somewhere. Pull this out of the way. Yeah, she's out in California. Um, she said this, just as tissue structure and function are connected reciprocally and dynamically, restoring normal tissue structure to tumor cells can restore normal tissue function. In other words, the structure has broken down just as I think Dr. Bartoloso is getting at. And even when the cells contain considerable underlying genomic aberrations, they can function normally if in the proper environment. Therefore, phenotype, <coughs> phenotype could dominate genotype in malignant cells as it does in normal tissues. The genes in different tissues and organs are identical if the phenotypes are totally distinct. Note bene, I say here, the role played by the microenvironment in providing a congenial soil, as we've been talking all the way through here, was identified at the end of the 19th century by Pageant in 1889, but the discovery of tumor viruses, oncogenes, tumor suppressors in the 20th century overshadowed these earlier studies as most researchers pursued cell autonomous mechanisms for cancer initiation, progression, and metastasis.
So I just put this one in just to, here's the, this is the skin, of course. <clears throat> and just to give you an idea of how easily these cells can communicate to each other in a metazoan multicellular animal with differentiated parts. You have the stem cells are down here and then they uh, gradually differentiate as they go up to the surface of the skin and then they become what's called terminally differentiated cells. Uh, terminally differentiated doesn't sound too fun, but there it is. Uh, so I just put through that slide and just to amplify you know, some certain things. So the cell I wrote, I've said this in the, at a symposium uh, back in Cold Spring Harbor. So key questions in cell and tumor biology include how tissues and organs maintain homeostasis and how cells with organisms lose or overcome these controls in cancer. Again, I think this is all relevant to what Dr. Bertoloso is saying as well. Uh, she said, Bissell went on to say, cells keep each other in line. Mechanical forces triggered by cells pressing up against each other can have a calming effect on cancer. A calming effect on cancer. Putting breast cancer cells under gentle pressure akin to what they may, might encounter growing in a healthy breast causes them to reconnect with their neighbors and behave like non-cancerous cells. <clears throat> they receive many cues from the environment about how to behave. Cancer is not a problem of growth as the entire field believes it's a matter of context. Place a cancer cell in a normal environment and it becomes normal. Place a normal cell in a cancer environment and it becomes cancerous. And down here, I have something hidden. It's so obvious, why don't people get it? <laughs> Feisty gal. I've never met her, but I'd love to meet her. Okay, so now this, the, if you stay with me just a little bit longer, um, that this is gonna be about cancer and the origin of the regressive hypothesis that I'm promoting here. So this is a, a, a lung cancer uh, diagnosed by chest x-ray that was, uh, and there are many different kinds of, of lung cancers. So think about it this way, that in normal lung development, certain genes are active early in the process, others are inactive. And as the organism develops, new genes come into play and other genes are quiet. And then development, finally, it's a full stage of development and they all shut down again. And that's can be applied, this was studied in mouse lungs, but it can be applied in human cancers. So carcinoid is the best one to get. And that happens to be the, the, the one that's in this area where the most uh, mature, so to speak, genes have, are being expressed toward the end stages of, of development. Adenocarcinoma occurs with earlier stages of things getting awry squamous cell, worse, and then the worst is small cell, where the, the, the cell is using, still using genes to be active in, in that, that part of the process. So as you move from carcinoid small cell, there's an increasing 
level of aggressiveness in the cancers that are produced. And I would submit a way to think about this, not proven, an increasing level of regression is, uh, so that's the hypothesis there. Put in the atavistic model of cancer progression, just to add that to the Paul Davies and Charlie Lineweaver, who were physical scientists, were funded by the National Institutes of Health to study cancer because there hadn't been a lot of pro progress that was helping uh, by the perspective of the National Institute. And so Davies and Lineweaver got on the problem. And he um, talked about a very interesting. Um, if I can get this out of the way or not, maybe not. Cancer cells uh, are cells that have been deregulated and fault back to these ancestral pathways that are now supposed to be shut down. So the cancer phenotype really he points out are expressed in early embryogenesis where that's normal for the development of the fetus embryo into a fetus, full, full mature fetus. So cancer is not running on defective genes, but perfectly normal genes, what he calls an ancient cassette that's been activated. They're upregulated inappropriately. You see it normally in embryogenesis, the growth of the embryo, but also that you see it in wound healing. But when that wound is healed, it shuts down again. So cancer cells look like monster cells, a mess, aneuploidy, which is an effect on the chromosomes. So cancer looks too efficient, he thought, and deterministic to be just an accident. It looks like a pre-programmed response to some stress. Now, he does not speculate about psychological stress. And gene mutations are a byproduct of cancer. Gene mutations as a byproduct of cancer. I, don't know, did I have something under here. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, cancer is a rerun of embryogenesis, but not well ordered. Fascinating idea. Again, it's not all that well accepted, but with the treatment of cancer being not so favorable output, uh, outcomes, this is getting more attention. Very good, good. So he's just showing us here how old cancer is. Now back into these. Um, these uh, very uh, ancient species of animals, cancer can develop there. So he, he, he suggested this man, Thomas Bosch, that cancer is as old as multicellular life on earth and will probably never be completely eradicated. Connecting the dots, chronic anxiety and cancer. I think I'm near the end here. I can't see my numbers. Um, oops, I want to come back here. Sorry about that. Connecting the dots, chronic anxiety and cancer, which I'm making the point were not causal, but unfavorable conditions related to it. So you get the stress on the organism, and they, they list early adversity, interpersonal conflict, social isolation, all valid to some degree, but they do not include uh, the kind of stress that chronic, chronic anxiety in relationship systems can generate. They do call, mention interpersonal conflict, of course. So that activates the corticotropin releasing hormone and 
that sends signals to the adrenal gland, send out cortisol, which in turn are pro issue pro inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, adhesion molecules, and acute phase reactants, all of which contribute to the development of the, the cancer. And over here, the sympathetic nervous system is also having direct effects on cells far distant in the body. So this, I just present this section to emphasize this is possible from what we know about the body. So here is normal colonic tissue and undisturbed surrounding matrix tissue. And here's a cancer of the colon and with a tumor associated uh, changes in the stroma. So it's a two in that the changes in the stroma activate the tumor, the tumor activates changes in the stroma. So it's an interdependent situation. Richmond Prain, who also since died in, back in two, 2007, most benign lesions do not transform to malignancy and many regress. Cell to cell or cell to matrix interactions appear to be major inhibitors of tumor growth. Immunostimulation may be an interference with cell to cell or cell to matrix communication, immunostimulation by a sublethal immune reaction. They don't kill anything, they just aggravate the situation. The brain was not considered an emotional organ until the 50s. And that's where Paul McLean came in with the limbic system, neocortex, reptilian brain, all that way. And this paved the way for demonstrating the connections, the emotions, the stress response, and the brain can have. Steve Cole, talks about this. The sympathetic nervous system regulates the function of virtually all human organisms. SNS activation can regulate gene expression and cellular function in the tumor microenvironment through a variety of pathways. SNS, unlike other stress-activated neuroendocrine systems, such as the hypopituitary phenol or adrenal gland, is easily active by mere anticipation of a threat. Anticipatory SNS threat responses often occur at thresholds below those experienced consciously. Unlike the HPA axis, the SNS stress responses do not decay over time with repeated threat exposure. So most, so SNS activity exerts its most pronounced effects in the early stages of tumor progression as primary tumors interact with the surrounding environment. Now this is a very complicated slide, so I won't focus on it too much. Part of it was Mike Lumpkin gave me the privilege to copy some things from his diagram. I put the family system stuff going on over here and then what's happening out in the periphery that can regulate expression of um, in the microenvironment. The buildup of the blood supply becoming greater into tumors, nerve growth, SNS fibers are tapping into the tumor, et cetera. And, um, get this out of the way. So you can see here, this would be a sympathetic nervous system uh, dropping some, uh, some noradrenaline, which can, can expand the blood supply for the tumor, and that allows the tumor to grow. This saying that it's, it, it's not ridiculous to assume that tumors are not there all by themselves. They can, they definitely depend on many outside changes. So Steve Cole suggested, we're now beginning to appreciate how the broader physiological 
macro environment of the body can regulate local tumor micro environmental dynamics and thereby affect tumor progression and metastasis. Now, he knows about the outside, he doesn't know about family systems theory. So three, I would suggest three likely components of a systems theory of cancer. Disturbance in family homeostasis, family homeostasis. Disturbance in overall body homeostasis. Emotional regression fueled, fueled by chronic anxiety. Some exceptions, of course, may occur. And that's it. Well, I went longer than I did. My wife told me I probably would. She was right. <laughs> but uh, so I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm not sure how much time we have still, but 15 minutes or less. Uh, well, we're right, we're right on time for our first break. Uh -oh. uh, my, su my suggestion would be that we take about, we're going to have a panel discussion later in the morning. So if you have questions from this, uh, obviously from this presentation, if you can make a note and we'll, you'll have time later to do that. But I would be willing to, to give like five more minutes and then we'll sh maybe shorten our break instead of 15 minutes, come back in 10 minutes. Great. So I'm going to open it up to questions for five minutes. And if anybody wants, has a question, if you would raise your hand, please. And obviously put uh, okay, unmute your mute button. Vicki Cohen, I'm going to unmute you. Oh, are you on here? You're, 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 I just, I just unmuted myself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So this was really interesting, um, and uh, and very personal. Um, I am um, in the process of recovering from um, myelodysplasia, a blood cancer. Um, I was fortunate enough that it was discovered before it turned into a leukemia. Um, I had chemo, cancer was obliterated. I had a bone marrow transplant, non-related donor. That was a year ago, June 1, 2021. So what's been interesting for me has been um, the year, so sort of after my first 100 days, dealing with something called graft versus host disease. GVHD. And this can occur in the lungs, on the skin. There's all sorts of symptoms that can occur when the donor cells and um, the host cells sort of are not um, agreeing with each other. Um, but what I've noticed is that I've had four flare-ups of GVHD. And what I've come to notice is the, um, the emotional field of what has triggered um, the flare-ups. My doctors are very medical model. You know, they're very, you know, address the symptom, we'll do this, we'll do that. Um, but I'm I'm sort of doing my own personal research study. I'm the only, I'm my only subject. Um, but I can really track sort of the trigger, sort of, and then the symptom occurs. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, on sort of this GVHD phenomenon that is fairly common in, in a bone marrow transplant. Yeah, I would just say that uh, I think it's always a mistake to dismiss anecdotal data, the kind of experience you yourself have, and keep that in mind in trying to better understand what's going on. So I appreciate your comment very much. Good luck with the rest of the, the proceeds. <laughs> So anybody else or if I sound the crowd? <laughs> Is that it? Anybody else would like to ask a question to Dr. Kerr? I see someone with their hand raised, but it says Kathleen Kerr and it doesn't look like Kathleen Kerr. <laughs> I don't see that. I'm so sorry. There's one. Oh, so I helped somebody get into the meeting with my link. So that could be my Hi, doppelganger. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. It's okay. That's my doppelganger. <laughs> yeah, it's Susan Love. Yeah. Hello, Susan. 
Hi. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for this. It's been rich so far. I was just curious about the study of potentially catching the process by which cancer begins to um, leave, you know, the, the delicacy of that interaction. So I just wondered if anybody is studying that phenomenon of what goes into cellularly when that begins to change. So-called spontaneous remissions, is that the kind of <laughs> Well, I wasn't even thinking about spontaneous necessarily, although I have right. read that. That's the name they give to it, too. Yeah, yeah. Is well, okay, it? sure. Right. Yeah, no, I just think it's evidence that, um, that it, when I was doing a meeting with Mike Lumpkin, um, I made the statement, I mean, cancer can exist in the body and not do any damage at all. We know that the prostate glands, I think the 20 to one ratio of uh, people who have cancer in their prostate gland, but it's not doing anything versus the ones that starts doing something. So how does that process of, of remission activate and, um, and make a, a difference in the outcome. So it's just the, the very high percentage of people, I think, uh, I don't know what the total, I think the figure I saw was 25 to 30% can get, um, once the even starts to grow, then it can remit with or without therapy. Well, thanks, good to see you.